Hello Year 12 students. So we are here with the last section of part four of Ransom by David Malouf. Um, we're going to look at in this section between um, the bottom of page 187 to page 201 and that uh, concludes uh, part four of the novel. And um, my subheading for this section is Achilles transforms. So we've seen a transformation in the part two and three of Priam where he begins to notice the mundane ordinary details of life and his eye is open to um, a world that he previously hadn't noticed um, and he adopts or embraces that identity as father as opposed to, to the symbolic ceremonial role of a king uh, and this section explores the final part of Achilles transformation so um, we begin at the beginning of this section um, Achilles has met with Priam and first thought it was his father Peleus, um, softened his heart towards him and um, as a result of their interaction has agreed to give back the body of Hector uh, and they've knelt together on the ground holding hands with an image of unity of shared humanity. Uh, there is somewhat of an understanding that has come between the two men um, and Achilles now goes as he has done every morning for the last 11 days to where the body of Hector lies in the dust. But it's with a different view now that he's going to um, the, the body of Hector. And Automedon goes with him. It's an hour before midnight. Um, so in your mind you'll have an image of late night and Achilles says that Automedon and the groom may go um, and I'll call when I need you. And Achilles is now alone with his thoughts. He draws his cloak about him. Perhaps that's symbolic of protecting or enveloping himself from the shock of the last interaction. Um, and at the feet lies the body of his dead enemy. And it shines as if with the light of another star, a metallic brightness, except for the wound at the throat where his sword went in, it is unmarked. The wound as as clean as it has just been made. And that's that reminder of the restoration. By the gods of the body of Hector. So after 11 days in the sun, the body has neither the discoloration nor the smell of corruption. Okay. And so Achilles sits down and he contemplates this. Okay. Each morning when he rides down to confront it, Hector's body, this is what he's find, this figure of what might be a sleeper. So Hector's body it looks like it's not even dead. He might be asleep, composed still in the naked perfection of its early manhood, laid out as a challenge to him from the gods to inflict upon it the savage depredations that his pride, his grief, his sense of his own high honour demand. So... In some ways, this challenge to him is like the gods' condemnation of Achilles' independent act of vengeance. Um, and he now acknowledges Achilles. Remember the narrative voice here of Achilles. So as he is thinking about it, he's reflecting and recognizing that his actions were savage depredations and they were caused by his grief, his pride, and his sense of his own high honor demand. And each morning when he discovers yet and again how the gods have defied him, he is maddened anew. Outrageous injury swells in his veins. So every day he is maddened. Um, and now, so we see, well, what about now after this meeting? 
Well, now he examines his enemy once again. He frowns and he raises his brow to the night sky. He says that something in him has freed itself and fallen away. So this madness has changed. The, um, the freshness here, okay, so the clear night sky, he breathes in the freshness. We notice by the sensory imagery here the symbolism of the fresh air representing his fresh approach. his newness inside his spirit, okay? Everything is changed. He's been freed. So now the body, his body and the body of Hector is also calm. There has been some cleansing emotion that has flooded through him. When? Was it when Priam first appeared like the figure his father, but when this cleansing emotion has flooded through him, it's cleared his heart of this smoky poison, this is a great quote by the way, that clogged and thickened its every motion. This is possibly the metaphor for revenge or bitterness or uh, vengeance as a smoky poison. And so <clears throat> he now sees Hector's body and how it's clean, it's perfect, it's undamaged by all of the depredations he's imparted on it. And he sees this splendor of a warrior who has now won an honorable death. And it's no longer, he's no longer offended or affronted by this. The affection of the gods for a man whose end it was part of his own accomplished life to accomplish, he can now take as an honour intended to himself as well. So that the affection of the gods for a man, Hector perhaps, whose end it was part of his own accomplished life to accomplish. So he was destined to end the life, but the gods had affection for Hector. Um that there was an honourable death for him. And that is how it might have been from the start, on the first night, not the twelfth night. So the way it perhaps should have been initially. So now he feels in himself a perfect order of body-heart occasion, the enactment of the true Achilles the one he has come all this way to find. So this is really the transformation quote, okay? So he's finally found himself. He's come all this way to find him, the true Achilles. And he could only become this true Achilles through, um, I guess, giving up the bitterness, giving up the desire for vengeance, um, giving up the madness that consumed him, that clogging grey web. And he sits in the quiet contemplation of this. Um, this torch casts a glow. And as long as he sits here, there is no conflict. They in, are in perfect amity. Their part in the war is at an end. So this body Hector's body, he can now accept as a mirror of his own. So this ends that section on the transformation, the, the a period of reflection where he really um, recognizes, forgives, releases all of the emotional baggage, I guess, um, and becomes who the true Achilles. And this next section is about the preparation of the body. So they now carry Hector's body into the laundry hut. And there's a description of the hut. There's oil, there's herbs, um, and 
they're going to anoint the body with the oil so they're preparing this body for burial remember that burning burying um, the body so doing the ceremonial processes associated with death uh, the belief at the time being that it would enable the proper um, delivery of the spirits to the afterlife to the underworld um, and so the Hector is now being given this honor and the women um, and it's women's work the women who have been woken are now at midnight getting up to actually do this women's work which is prepare the body for burial now this is the world of women now it's interesting the different realms that are presented here by David Maloof, the king's realm, the ordinary realm, and here he presents the world of women. Um, and Achilles has never been or never seen this section. Similarly to um, the world opening up for Priam, we see now Achilles is intrigued, curious perhaps, by this uh, new, uh, new world, and he's curious to see this body on its passage toward extinction. Um, he says, the last commerce with the new world is in the hands of women. Interesting that they're born by women and then uh, the last, the, the mirroring or the paralleling of the coming into the world through women and exiting the world be, um, in the hands of women. And this place compels him. There's something here about the atmosphere the sweet smell that he recognizes. Um, this might be linking into some of those quotes early in the book where he remembers the um, his mother's element and his mother's influence. But now he is actually remembering a room where he was taken in the arms of his nurse. Um, and so remembering the, the laundry women brings back some memories from his own childhood. He says, uh, this first world we come into and the last place we pass through, both through the hands of women. He says, these unheroic thoughts. Now, Hector's body is naked and it lies waiting. The women's presence is strong. This is their world. And while Achilles is there, he, he is fascinated by it. He's unwilling to break away. But while he doesn't break away, the women won't actually begin their work, their women's work. So he leaves. And then he notices a juxtaposition here, the contrast between the laundry women and the world of women to his myrmidons who are on duty. And there's metal of swords glinting um, and they are bodies are sinewy taught ready for hard use so there's a hardness here and out here for a time yet he is one of them so this is where he belongs but he, and he remembers the warmth how warm he is with the fire there for a time and this is again um a acknowledgement of the inevitability of his death also till he too like hector mm. is in there is in that room, that laundry room where the bodies are prepared for burial and for burning, naked as he began, being turned this way, then that in the hands of women. Um, and I just wrote a, no, um, a little notice. So it's, it's interesting that um, perhaps this suggests a greater power for women than the society at the time acknowledged, um, that they did play a role, significant role. Um, in some ways anyway so um, and here uh, it's first thing in the morning Priam wakes up and Achilles is touched by the old man's dignity even in sleep so there's a sense a tone of admiration in the narrative description of Priam by Achilles indicating a newfound understanding and respect that they have for each other after the last night's interlude. Um, and Priam yeah, is awoken by Achilles 
and the old man. We have pop into the narrative perspective of Priam a little bit. Um, jumps here. And um, there is two servants and they bring a pitcher and a bowl and cloth to wash Priam. Um, and one of them yawns and then looks to see if Achilles has seen it. So I think this is... Um, um, automaton and um, and and Alcimus. Um, remember, it's through Priam's perspective, so he doesn't know their names. He just observes them as two um, servants. But they um, they look at each other, yawn, they check, and and this exchange catches Priam's eye for such irrelevant happenings. So this is Priam's awakening to the ordinary, to things like this. So he's noticing something and that enlivens him. It has an enlivening effect. And he has this sense of how the world is full of the odd and engaging things. And so he gets up and um, then Alcimus pours and splashes water on his head and he's actually being washed by Achilles' servants and they give him a cloth and Priam is struck by the strangeness of this moment. Um, and he is being attended by strangers um, and he is there with the killer of his son, the dread Achilles, who is standing watching as he's being washed. And so the unexpectedness of this scene He says it has the quality of a dream where events and objects seem both puzzling and glowingly familiar. You know how dreams, you, you know what's happening in the dream, but you are confused by them sometimes if you stop to think about it, but you don't seem that way while you're inside the dream, perhaps. But this is no dream. He has a curiosity. Again, that's the new impulse that's been awakened through chatting with Somax of about Achilles to know more of the hidden contrary in this boldest, ferocious, unpredictable Greek. He thinks maybe it'll be useful to him later, maybe to save them from what otherwise might come. And late at night, last night, He'd been treated with courtesy. Achilles has gone out to choose a good-sized hog. He's chosen a pig for him and they've laid it on a board like a guest of honour. So they've had a, a kind of um, a feast for Priam. He's been the guest of honour. The strangeness continues. Um, and the Myrmidons have been dismissed and so... It's just Achilles and Priam negotiate a truce. They have nine days for the Trojans to go to Mount Ida and get the logs for Hector's pyre, funeral pyre, and there's nine days of mourning in the city. And on the 10th day, they're going to burn the body, and the 11th day, raising of the burial mound, um, maybe burying the ashes. It's like, a, to me, if you have a pipe, maybe, I don't even know why you have both a um, burning and a burying. Maybe somebody will be interested in looking that up and letting me know. I don't know why, but anyway. And then the war begins after, on the 12th day. So 11 days of peace that's been neg negotiated. Um, and <clears throat> these 11 days... Days of sorrow, mourning, but also a holiday from the din and dread of battle. Alliteration. A time for living. And, and he and intimacy, uh, sorry, he and Achilles, as they ate together last night's supper, they discovered a kind of intimacy that was wary at the wary at the first, but also respectful. And at last quite easy. Priam had to remind himself who it was that he was breaking bread with. And what lay out there in a sheet waiting to be reclaimed, the body of his son. 
Um, he had eaten little, but he'd taken something from each dish. But Achilles ate heartily, which is in contrast to how he ate at the beginning. So now he's relaxed, he can actually eat. Um, and then we continue with the bottom of 199. Then the next morning, we'll come back to present tense. Priam is refreshed by sleep and he goes together to the yard. The wagon is loaded <clears throat> and loaded with the body of Hector. Um, there's the mules. Um, so Priam talks about the lifetime of, or in his head, he's narrating a lifetime of discipline to hide from them what he's feeling. So he, I guess, acts like the body of his son isn't there, maybe. Um, he extends his hand to good idiots to be helped up. So remember that in the beginning he kind of had to be forced up, but now he's um, anticipating that help to be led up. And he's surprised by how quickly this has become familiar and pleasant to him. The driver's calloused hands, noticing also the contra contrast of smooth hands and calloused hands, um, ready to go back to Troy. Um, and even this discomfort of the wooden crossbench, so hard on a man's bones, is a homecoming. Achilles accompanies them to the gate and... Here, this last interaction between Achilles and Priam. Achilles says, call on me when the walls of Troy are falling around you and I will come to your aid, symbolising this friendship, this uh, new mutual respect that they have. It is their moment of parting. Priam pauses and the cruelty of the answer that comes to his lips surprises him. And he says, and if when I call you are already among the shades, which means what if when I call you, you're, when, when I call for help, you're already dead? Achilles feels a chill pass through him. It is cold. And he says, then alas for you, Priam, I will not come. It is, Achilles knows, a joke of the kind the gods delight in, who joke darkly. Smiling in the foreknowledge of what they had already seen, both of them, he lifts his hand and on a word from the driver, the cart jolts out, out of the camp. Um, and so this bit I find quite confusing. So if you do find it confusing, um, that's normal, I guess. So it's a slight foreshadowing to the fact that actually Achilles is going to die before the end. Um, and he knows that as well. Now here it says the foreknowledge of what they both have seen. My question was, well, sorry. My question was, did they both see Priam's death at the hands of Neoptolemus? Or, because my memory of that, my reading of that was that that was the red tinge through Achilles' eyes. And I certainly saw nothing in that section that led me to believe that Priam also saw this. So I really am not quite sure um, what exactly that's referring to. Um, but I guess you will notice a a respect and also a bitter sweetness, a bitterness at the same time, perhaps knowing Achilles is about to die and that Priam is going to die in Neoptolemus' hands. So there is a truce, um, a respect, but also an acknowledgement that they, their fates are connected, perhaps. You know, I really, honestly, if you can work it out, let me know. Drop a comment in the um in below and perhaps contribute your thoughts as to the end of this section. Okay, that's the end of part four.